It's time for another Dice Tower review with the Chief, Bart Brunsheen. Hey, it's the Chief from the Dice Tower, and I'm with Hamtag. Hamtag! All right, it's Judd Vance, Greg Schmickens, and today we're going to talk about um, our top five games from the 2014 BGG Con. Um, now, I know you guys, uh, War Games, I did not play. I didn't really play too many war games or anything that would count as a war game at BGG Con, so mine aren't gonna quite follow the rule. These guys were in the war game room. Right, most of the time. That's all I played. They were there, all I played. Let's, well, it's all you play. Let's start with you, Judd. Okay. Um, when I was my first BGG Con, and one of the things I really wanted to get at this is I have this obsession with getting all of my games played, or at least understanding how to play them all. So I saw this as a real opportunity to knock some games off that I otherwise would have difficulty doing or might not be able to. So I played, I don't know, like seven or eight new games, spent two months learning rule books and trying to hold them all in my mind. And then I grabbed a few that I could teach that were pretty easy. Um, my number five game is Gulf Strike. Published 1983, I believe, yeah, and republished, I mean, redone in 88, Victory Games. Designed by the guy who back in the Cretaceous was known as Awesome Saurus Rex. Today he goes by Mark Herman. Um, reason this game's here. You knew it was cut in there. The reason this one's here. I saw this game back in 1982, King's Crown, Kansas City. It looked cool. I passed on it. Looked, you know, probably bigger than my britches back then, definitely. Found it in a secondhand store back when I got into games, like a lot of us laid out for a while and got back into it. Seven bucks. So, oh, there's that game. Hey, seven bucks, what's it worth? I didn't even know who Mark Kerman was. Played We the People shortly after. Noticed a similarity. Said, oh, I'll look, look at the rule books. <laughs> got scared. A few years later, I thought, man, this thing's just too big. And um, got a guy offering me a trade, so I traded it. Then I started regretting it as I learned for the people in the Empire of the Sun. Got it back. Still wanted to play it. So I put a thing on the War Game Request list, and Gordon, Gordo MG, if you know me as a worm with a machine gun avatar, uh, he said, sure, I'll try it, I'll learn it with you, which isn't the best way to learn a complicated game. Um, but hey, it's, my, it's, it's a harder game to get in. So we tried it out, we stumbled, we bumbled through the thing, missed, butchered a lot of rules in it. Um, my favorite one was I had my Soviets. Um, launched a strike against his carriers. He scrambled some F-14s, turned one of them back. I got a couple through, fired a shot, and sunk a nuclear carrier. I'm like, yeah! We learned shortly after that range 16 isn't 16 out and back. It's round trip. I was 16 hexes away, so I had kamikaze Soviets. Um, but we learned the system in the process, went back home, studied the rules, saw the places we messed up, but I had so much fun. It's a fun game to play wrong, but <laughs> yeah, that's one of my great compliments of games. It's, really, it's a fun game even when you yeah. screw it up. Yeah. But um, very cool. It has a, Mark Herman's, most, almost all of his games, uh, that's why I like him so much, they always have this, you don't know what the enemy can bring to bear against you. It's not, I'm looking at the board, I know everything, I'm going to take risk with my odds and roll the dice and hope. Now I got to check, we usually do number five last. Is this your number one? No, this is my number five. <laughs> it's because I, we butchered it so bad and really didn't get Seemed the full game excited. in. But it was, because it was, I love taking on a game, but this is one of my top five toughest games I ever learned. It's not as tough as Empire of the Sun. It's a pretty smooth system. It's just the sequence of plays, like three or four pages long. So it tells you there's some complicated decisions going into it, but it's not a hard system. But it's cool because when you send your units out, you don't know, is that F-14 on an escort mission or is it on an air superiority mission? There's like a little counter underneath and until you go to combat. Um, you have to designate everybody ahead of time, each unit, whether they're on offense or defense. If you put everybody on the offense, if you got nothing to protect you. So there's this balance thing going on. And it works the trifibious, slant, ground, naval, and air. Um, and when this thing, when, the, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, I'd read this article online, that um, they scrambled and said, do we have any simulations on this? And they said, yeah, Gulf Strike. So they had studied it, so there you go. Our country depends upon Mark Herman to secure it. So there you go. Tell you, he's awesome. <laughs> Anyways, that's my number five goal strike. Um, people gripe about out of, print, out of print games recommend. You can get this pretty easy for 25 bucks. I got a copy last night. Mine didn't have, my first one had the Gulf Strike expansion. I've been trying to secure it because my second version doesn't. It's been going like 25, 30 bucks. I got a copy of Gulf Strike 3rd edition that has it in there. That's all I wanted was the expansion. 
99 cents. So if you're really desperate for this, if you promise to read it and play me on Vassal, I'll make you a sweet deal for it. He brings this up because a lot of people say we talk about games you can't go buy anymore, but come on with eBay. And yeah, 25 bucks. Come on, you're going to buy a game cheaper. That's my number five Gold Strike. G, I'm sorry, Victory Games on GMT. Uh, speaking of awesome, let's go Greg. Okay. <laughs> There's a transition. Right? So, to Greg with my awesome. number five game that I played down at BGG Con is Maneuver. It's a little small tactical card game on Napoleonic War. You've got this of uh, eight units of the French or the British or the Americans or the Turks. And uh, you've got a deck of cards where you can move or, or attack with specific units. So it's just a little tactical game, takes a little over an hour. The reason why it was my number five game down in, at Beach G-Con is because the reason I played it down there is during the Wargamers meet and greet, which there will be more about that later, we had a separate meet and greet session at the beginning of the convention. We talked about people wanting to learn games, and one of the people there said, well, what I'd really like to learn is maneuver. And I was able to say, oh, I know that game. There's a copy in the library, so I can teach you. So I ended up teaching a couple new gamers how to play maneuver. It's not going to get them into Empire of the Sun or ASL right away, but it was a new war game that they wanted to learn, and I got to teach them, and that was a very positive experience for me. So <laughs> Maneuver at BGG Con was my number five game at BGG Con last November. Good. Yeah, I want to hear more about that meet and greet when you get to it. Um, my number five, not a war game, pretty much, was... Uh, Castles of Mad King Ludwig. It is a defensive military place, but uh, absolutely not a war game. Um, I liked it. Uh, I do not have Suburbia, which uh, everybody kind of compares it with. There was a, a potential for some AP when uh, the pieces are set out. Um, you get to, or I think it's the, the number one player who goes last, gets to set the order at which their bid cost is going to okay. be. And um, luckily, I had a real good table. I recognized that was an AP point, and you could really lock in and try to figure out. And it was just kind of go by feel. That's the only complaint I've heard at all on this is that uh, potential for AP if you're playing with an AP kind of person. But it was just fun building the castle and, and then you know trying to trick your points out on your on your building spaces. So, uh, castles of Mad King Ludwig. Very fun game. I did see it played at our local hmm. uh, since since BGG Con. It was played, and it seemed to be moving along. So I'd say you know if you got the right players, yes. it'll move. Yes. So it's just a game. <laughs> yeah. My number four is Hold Fast Russia. I already knew this game when I went down there. I had to have a few on there because I had too many rule books memorized. Uh, Rusty Ballinger was looking to learn this. I said, shoot, I'll teach you. I love this game. My 2014 game of the year. Um, Love the thing. It's one of the simplest games to cover East Front Russia. Um, takes five minutes to learn how to play, about three to four hours to play. It's always an epic duel that goes right down to the end. Usually one lucky die roll seems to pull it off or break the, I mean, lose it or win it for you. And um, it has maneuvers, mud, all the, the core that you recognize in Russia without going, without steeping itself in too many, um, too much chrome. So yeah, we had a blast with this one. I got them right at the end. My Soviets held off and held Moscow and Leningrad and had a great time with it. That's my number four, Hold Fast Russia by Worthington. So this is Barbarossa, 41, 40. Uh, yeah, it only, goes up to, it only goes up to basically like January of 43. Right. and says if you can't, or 42, if you can't win by that point, you ain't going to win. Hmm. It's January 43 because I yeah. bought it based on Judd's recommendation and I've enjoyed it so far. Hmm. Okay, my number four game at the convention was 1989. This is a game on the downfall of communism by Ted Torgerson. It's very, many of the mechanics are very similar to Twilight Struggle. Uh, scoring is a little different. The reason why this was my number four game, first of all, it was the first game I played when I arrived. I had arranged it with a person whose BGG username is Hoojix. Oh, I know. And, I know. yeah. I played and, Blue and Grapes. Right, right. Oh. And he and I played this game. I was the uh, the Democrats. I, I was way ahead at one point, and then he took over East Germany, pulled me back. On the last play of the game, I had a card that was going to give him the win, but he played a card that let me discard my card. 
Mm. And instead I drew a card that let him score East Germany, and he still won the automatic <laughs> victory. But it was a great back and forth game, a great way to start the convention. Uh, 1989, my number four game this year at BGG Con. Now when he played the card that made you discard the card that was going to give him the win, you did show him that, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. Could you just that he could, have, he could have done support checks <laughs> and and taken away several places from me because going into, if I could have lasted till final scoring, I controlled Poland and Czechoslovakia. Hmm. That's awesome. That is good. All right. My number four is Fiasco. And you're saying, what? It's a role playing game. However, this is my closest war game that I played during the con because we used the, a World War II theme. It's, it's role playing where everything is gonna go bad. So it it's almost feels like theater. Um, and the little folio we had sets you in a, uh, in a, uh, like a reorganization area where you've got guys that have been in decimated units that are waiting to be reassigned to new units and brand new folks coming in. And then you create a conflict and you go through. And we did this, we did do this in the uh, war room. Not the main <laughs> war room, but the other one. Because okay. uh, we got checked on saying, hey, are you guys playing a war game? Yeah, kind of. You know, Sorry. Yeah, it is World War II. I didn't know if it counted. But uh, I got to play it. I uh, met some new people. Uh, Colin from Canada was there. Matt or Bixby was there. And uh, so I played with some good old friends and then met some new people. And it was just a nice experience. I never played Fiasco. So, so how big? Pe how many people? Um, you can really add in. Well, how many did you do? You? It was four. Or okay. Five. Five. And how long? Uh, well, it went, it went long because it was late and some people just kept going. So this went three hours. Three hours, so okay. It, okay. From my understanding, it, it normally shouldn't go quite that long. Okay. But some people uh, like to talk. Judd, it's your turn. Okay. Oh, I didn't mention Holdfast. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Holdfast is still in print. You can get it 40 to 60 bucks. So Worthington Publishing if you can't find it anywhere else. So there you go. Recommend it. My number three is Gettysburg as uh, a tree frog, one shirt tree frog, yes. war frog. Martin Wallace, 2010, out of print. Sorry to say, this one's going to cost you an arm and leg. You're going to be spending be. at least $100 on this one. Yes. Uh, simple Gettysburg game. If you've ever played a Martin Wallace war game, they always had this real interesting Euro thing going, which you're like, huh? You hate Euros and don't like them. Now, I actually like his war games because of that little Euro thing. It's something interesting. He wasn't shooting for historical simulation he says as much in the in the um, instruction in the designer notes he was looking for balance and he was wanting to model some interesting command and control to, um, mechanics in it and he really got it it is a blast to play joe minor played this with me he had to teach me in my first game um, make sure i didn't screw the rules up um, it was pretty epic my confederates came that close to taking little round top he drove me off of it um, but, and one of the funniest things I like to tell was I had got on uh, um, Culp's Hill. He had fought me back. He put some hits on my guys. I had to do a morale check. They would only fail on a one. I had three units. I got this one. I rolled a one, one, one. Oh, wow. Took a picture of it. Another one, I had three guys that fell on a one, two, and four. And I go, watch this. One, rolled it. Two, rolled it. Four. And I took a picture of it. It was pretty epic. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's a pretty pricey game, pretty simplistic. This isn't going to be the end-all, be-all of Gettysburg games. There's tons of them out there. I've had a lot of fun ones. I just like the little spin Martin Wallace put on this. It's kind of a little difficult to explain the mechanics. You'll probably find a review, but pretty darn clever. That's my number three. What's play length? Oh, uh, I think we played about three and a half hours, maybe four, but he part of the like same to play teaching that me. with you sometime. Yeah, that's part of why it took me so long. I like to make a vassal module, but I wanted to try it out first, and it's kind of hard to get a session mm -hmm. in like that. So I finally got to try it. Vassal module coming this year. Um, Martin Wallace gave me permission. So Gettysburg, Tree Frog 2010. Okay, my number three game doesn't have a box because it is not yet. We played, uh, I played a couple of games and observed a couple of games of Churchill. Mm -hmm. By coming out by GMT, it's a Mark Herman design, the cooperation game, three players, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt. You're uh, trying to win the war and get ready for the post-war situation. Um, like I said, I got to play a game because Joe Miner, who's actually Andy Malley, one of my best wargaming buddies, who I see every year at BGG Con, and then we go to JerkCon together in February. He's coming. He he comes to. Uh, he's coming to the ASL tournament in May down in Dallas, or in Austin, 
and then we see each other every year at WBC. So I see Andy a lot. He's the one that fabricated the uh, playtest game. And uh, so I got to play it several times, got to observe it several times, and my appetite is still wet mm. to, to see that game come out. It's, it's a great interactive game, uh, for, and you don't see a lot of three-player games out there. Yeah. So Churchill was my number three game at BGG Con this year. My number three is Dead of Winter. Uh, it's from Plat Hat Games. It's the uh, kind of a co-opetition game as well. It's got a zombie theme, but that's really not the deal. The, the thing is, and I can't remember the name of these cards, Crossroads cards, I think. Basically, there's cards that, that may or may not trigger on your turn, and it really gives you a nice narrative feel as you play the game. Um, I ended up being, they don't call it a traitor, but I was a traitor, kind of like uh, being the Cylon of Battlestar Galactica. And it was really nice because everybody's got their own thing they're going for. I had to make the civilization or, or group fail, but I had to have certain things if I was going to win. And another player at the table was a hoarder which not everybody's always his stuff, and he kept stealing my stuff that I needed. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> so I, uh, sadly, we, uh, we did not survive as a colony, but I didn't even get my independent win. Because uh, uh, you didn't have your stuff. Right, because the hoarder kept taking my stuff. And what was really interesting was one of the guys, his role was he had to find the traitor. Well, I had played it so well that uh, he... he thinks it's a 50 fit well he, he doesn't think i'm the traitor and he smokes a guy out and it, it ends up not being and he's down to 50 50 now and what it turns out is he had to find the traitor for his win condition and i'm actually telling him as a traitor i wouldn't do this if you miss we all lose so he says you're not the traitor and he sinks the other guy but because of the hoarder <laughs> So it had this real nice <laughs> thing going on. Oh yeah, that sounds real yeah, nice. It was fun. No, I no, it. you must. <laughs> I, I like playing the people because I'm thinking, why is he doing this? And I didn't want him to pick because I'm thinking I got a better shot triggering this myself. And he's forcing it. <laughs> and then I found out that was his victory condition was he had to find the traitor. So otherwise he was losing. So I, I love the personal conflicts that can be created. And uh, it was just fun in a game dynamic. So. Okay. Okay, my number two. Another one of those ones that I would have had a hard time learning by myself. Arden 44 GMT originally came out in 2003, reprinted in 2012 as a second edition. Bigger, I think it's second map, which the two maps together are probably too big for your table. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty close. Big. Yeah, really? it's close. Yeah, yeah. designed by no. Curtis Mark Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I tried it this a few years ago. I had to take it down because it's needed the table at Christmas. <laughs> it's it's interesting. The rule book's not really big. It's not real complicated. It's got interesting little chrome bits that work, but they're not common things. But it, what it does, it takes a complicated idea and boils it into something simple. But because it's unconventional, it's a little tough for me to wrap my brain around. So Michael McAlpin taught it to me. Great teacher. You run into guys like Greg and him. Excellent way to learn some really some pretty tough games. Um, he took the Germans, said they're tougher to learn your first time out. Um, we played the short scenario. Um, he won it pretty quickly, uh, but it was great fun. It has some cool ideas like you know you zone of control, you stop. This has something called zone of control bonds, where it's like you know grab your arms, red rover, red rover, try to break. You're not breaking that thing. Right. Cool concept. Like these little roadblock stumbling things that slow your movement down. You place them on the board, roll a die, and they have numbers on them. And you, so, and then you pick up two each turn. So it might be two you wanted, two you didn't want. So it's this random thing that kind of shows you how the Germans had problems. And just lots of little nuances in there that aren't tough, just not conventional. Really slick game. I have heard this and Bitter Woods generally called the best bulge games. And probably if I read more, more of what I read that this one's even the, the better of the two. So it might be the best bulge game ever. It's the best one I've definitely played. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's my number two, Ardan 44. Michael, thanks a bunch. It's really, yeah, it's, it's really good. I just I actually got a play in last year. It's tough for the Germans to win the big game, but the, the mini scenario is a really good tight contest. Yeah. yeah, the first scenario doesn't introduce some of the concepts of oil shortages, so it does have a little bit of this programmed 
play that you can keep adding scenarios and get more complicated. Also, if you've heard about it, second edition, oh, the first, uh, price. First edition you get for about 40, the second for 100. So um, I'm not sure that second one, unless you're into the big monster campaign, you might want to save the money or wait for the third that they'll print out. And also the, um, I forgot what I was going to say, was that's good. Okay. My second favorite gaming experience at, at BGGCon this year was Advanced Squad Leader. Any of you who know, who are familiar with the system will recognize this is board number one, which has the ultimate ASL starting scenario, the Guards Counterattack. I got to play that this year with Gordo MG, and it was a, a, good, a good, fun, tight, uh, you know, a tight game, but uh, I showed him some of the uh, line of sight, the, the easy way to check some line of sights and cut your line of sight in half and really improves your accuracy. Uh, drilled him on all of the options for the first, uh, first fire, subsequent first fire, final protective fire, final fire, all of the ways to keep guys from jumping on top of you. So that was a good experience. Plus I got in two more games while I was there. I played against, uh, I did not write down his name. I played Jason, I'm pretty sure was his name, uh, at a scenario called Eye of the Tiger. It's a scenario developed by uh, Windy City War Gamers out of Chicago. But that was another fun scenario. I was a Russian, he was doing a German attack down toward me and his Tiger tank got to a crossroads outside of town and I immobilized it with a with a uh, smaller anti-tank gun and then I got in a starter kit. People complain at BGGCon that sometimes it's tough to get a pickup game of war games because you got to plan. I had the ASL starter kit set up and somebody walked by and said, oh, advanced squad leader. I said, yes, would you like to sit down and learn? And we went through a scenario, one of those uh, released uh, from the east, from the starter kit. So I got in three games of uh, ASL slash starter kit while I was down there. And for me, that was my number two experience at BGGCon this year. Hmm. Now, do they have a, uh, on the starter kit, is there a, a game session that'll be around an hour or are they all still pretty long? Or are they do that? Uh, I think that it, I think these scenarios usually take well, about two. Hmm. Okay. Right. They're still not, yeah, they're still not that quick. All right. My number two is uh, a game of Police Precinct. It was real cool uh, from Common Man Games and uh, Carl Finner. I think I'm saying your last name right, Carl. Sorry. Um, he had actually asked me to sit in and play on the second printing that's about ready to, to ship. Um, it was a Kickstarter second printing and uh, it was just kind of neat. I've had a, a little bit of involvement in that game and so there was a couple people that, that wanted to play and were, were interested that I was going to be playing as well and then there was there was some other folks that sat in that really knew the game really well. And uh, on this uh, second printing, the flip side of the board has what he calls the uh, the Unter board or the Unter City and it's, it's a harder version not that you need a harder version because I, I have a hard time winning on the front part of the, the board. But what was really cool was uh, uh, Carl was pretty sure we were going to lose in about 15 minutes and it wasn't looking good. And the group actually coalesced and we really started working together well as a team. He sat back and just watched. I think he kept thinking we were going to lose and we pulled off the victory all the way through and it ended up being a great, great game. So we had a lot of fun. Uh, Police Precinct, uh, the second printing. Okay. Um, my, I played, I think, seven other games. Had fun with all of them. The emphasis I had here was new games. Hold Fast is the only one that wasn't new. So I wrote, my thing, I was really loving learning some of these new games. My number one game, Bart, I'm hoping you can put a picture of this up because it's not real easy to see mm -hmm. the picture. I'll it's, put a pick up. It's the Great Invasion, the Gettysburg Campaign. 1985 Clash of Arms games. Um, long out of print. If you can find it, you're probably not going to spend that much on it. The other games in the series don't go for much. Just a little trickier to find, but it's it's not going to cost you an arm and leg. I'm going to guess you can get it for less than 30. Um, played this with Chris Montgomery. 
Got this game a few years ago, will not solitaire at all. Thought, man, I'm never gonna get this thing played. Threw it out there, he happened to have a copy. Been wanting to make a vassal module, no unpunched counter sheets. Couldn't find them anywhere, he had them. Vassal module coming this year. Anyway, it's the one Civil War game I've played that really understands cavalry. Your units are upside down in little small stacks. When they go out there to find them, you can bring your cavalry out to screen against their reconnaissance missions. They will have a certain amount of luck based on the, if their cavalry is stronger than yours or if you have none. And that tells how many units they get to look at. So they use, they're using them as the eyes and ears like they really did. You go into combat, um, you have little chits that it's, it's pretty, it's one of those old 80s combat results, many steps to it but it works really good as far as the intensity. If you charge me and I counter charge you, it's gonna be bloody. So, you know, there's, that factors into casualties. Um, the really cool thing at the beginning, this isn't Gettysburg, this is the campaign, begins on June 24th. The Confederates have three options to victory, gather so many supplies, hit certain strategic points, or um, cause, or basically try to destroy the Army of the Potomac. They draw one and keep it to themselves. They have to gather so many supplies no matter which one they take. So it's this bluffing thing. I had him thinking I was going for the supply victory. I was just back here and he started force marching, losing guys to stragglers. I really had to break the Army of the Potomac. At the end of the game, there's these different categories and based on your goal is the victory point. Supplies are worth more if that's your goal. Um, my, so stragglers are really hurting him because I'm trying to break his army. Every casualty scored me that many more victory points. He ran to me, I got into defensive positions this time. So I ended up pulling off the win, but um, it's so cool because you feel really like Lee and also um, oh, Meade, sorry. You don't know what they're up to. You're sending the cavalry out, you're trying to find out what it's all about. It really gave me that feel like I was really in the thing. Beautiful game, there's more in the series. There's like three or four games in the series. I think Chris said he liked it better than the Great Campaigns, whatever that is. That Great Memphis. Campaigns of the American yeah, Civil War. That he thought this did a better job in a lot of aspects. Does um, Stuart show up when you need him? Yes, he actually does. <laughs> yeah, good. a nice switch with yeah. some wagons. Yes, he does, and it helps you with some supplies. <laughs> but it does hurt you that you don't have your eyes and ears there. You feel like Lee. You want to tell him those those wagons are useless to me. Yeah, or yeah. Um, so, first of all, about how long does it play? Did we were stumbling through it, right. learning it together. I would say it's probably a three-hour game. Okay. It's kind of an ugly 80s map, too. but. <laughs> and, so, yeah, you, I've got a, one of those. Thin counters are really those. hard even for the tweezers. Uh, and then, secondly, um, is there any uh, hidden objectives that the Union has got? No, anything? their whole thing is to try to figure out the Confederates up to. They'll, okay. score, they'll score victory points their own ways. I mean, the casualties, things like that factor right. into it. But um, yeah, that whole hidden thing, I really got that feel. Beautiful game, the Great Invasion, Gettysburg Campaign, Clash of Arms, my number one game. Thanks, Chris. Hmm. Right. Okay, my number one, I'm sure you know, anybody who knows me, if ASL was number two, what's number one? Number one for me was the Wargamers meet and greet that we had this year. Uh, Steve Smith, one of you live here in Wichita, he's now back east, he's moved east, talked at the end of the 2013 BGG Con that he wanted to get together with some people because he just felt like he and a lot of players just wander around looking for war games to play. So we set up a meet and greet. 50 people showed up the Wednesday night of the convention, which surprised me that there would be that many people. And there was a lot of talk and interplay about how to do things better. Like, as I mentioned earlier, my game of um, maneuver came out of it. I ended up getting in a pickup game of Fire in the Lake because of the, the meet and greet. Some of the things we are talking about for next year is, is getting schedules out there to show the new players where they can learn to play a game or where they can watch a particular game. You know, like if, if somebody owned Great Invasion and there was a game being played, uh, then they would know, oh, if I go to th this place at this time, I might see somebody that knows how to play it. Uh, we're talking about having uh, some, there is pros and cons but we, there was discussion about having a little tournament next year for Twilight Struggle, since it is the number one game on Board Game Geek. No, not everybody wants to play Twilight Struggle or play it multiple times in a convention, but there were some people who did. So we're gonna look into setting up things like that, but just 
getting together with all the war gamers, talking about war games there, talking about how maybe setting up a, a more dedicated area so that you know you can really get a, a critical mass of war gaming in a space. So for me, the number one war gaming thing that happened in BGGCon this year was the war gamers meet and greet, and there's going to be another one next year. Hmm. That sounds really cool. Way to go. Gave Much. away some pretty good games too. Yeah, Partners was a gave away good games. Yeah, we did have some giveaways. Five games and I'd made vassal modules for three of them. Hmm. <laughs> Much like what Greg just covered, and BGG for me is a very social con as well, cluster fight. Now, uh, I'm going to explain. I had run, I won't go into detail because uh, I'd ran a tasting event on a type of beverage. Email me if you want to know more about that. But right afterward, I'd met all these folks uh, through this event, um, and somebody said, hey, you know, uh, rather than just breaking up and going down, uh, we were in a suite, why don't we go get some games and, uh, and play something? Uh, one of the guys came up with Cluster Fight. Here's all Cluster Fight is. It's like a, it's a beefed up apples to apples, and it's shy of Cards Against Humanity, so it's not going into the dirty realm, but it's got some extra things to it. All you're doing is you get three fighters and then you get three other cards that can be items or change it from a, a, a battle royale into anything, a dance contest, whatever. It's goofy, uh, but it's a very nice social game to get to know people. And uh, we were with a very animated group. There was a, a gentleman there with his wife. Uh, he works for Google. There was another guy there who works for Pixar. He had me there, a cop. There's this other guy from Iowa. And we get together and we play this game and everybody was so into the mood and, and who's gonna win. So kind of like apples to apples where somebody's the judge and you're picking what fits. And this one you're just picking, you know, who basically ends up winning if you've got Kirk, Picard, a Care Bear, and a dinosaur. You would pick the dinosaur. dinosaur but maybe I nerfed the dinosaur and instead of a battle royale, it's a tight roping con walking contest. Well, the dinosaur is not winning that. So it's goofy and silly. There'll be a review coming, but it was the, again, the social aspect of what happened. I'd never heard of this game and, and it just was so much fun to play with new folks. And uh, that's why it was my number one game experience is what I'm gonna say mm -hmm. at BGG Con. Mm -hmm. So um, guys, if you're not going to BGG Con, Come on down. If you're a war gamer, you're missing out. These guys are, I mean, you're talking serious gaming, war gaming going on. If you're a gamer in general, you're going to like it. It's a very social, fun place to be. And you're even coming back, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an yeah. extra vacation. So there you go. Year. All right. Ham All right. tag. Ham tag. Okay. We're out of here. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.